I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness. Right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Hello, 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 hello. Hello, 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 hello. Well, little Miss Honey, how are you today? I'm eager and anxious. Well, what are you eager and anxious about? Today is the day we're supposed to be taking a trip to the moon with Flash Gordon, isn't it? Oh, yes, so let's get busy and read the funnies right away. Yes, please. Well, here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly, but first let's listen to this nice man. Now, here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on top of the first page, hop along, Cassidy. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Six guns blazing as he thunders along. Give us music for hop along. <laughs> Hoppy has learned that Don Ramos's ranch is going to be put up for auction. He suspects Sloat and his crooked gang are to blame. So the day of the auction, Hoppy and California ride up to bid in the ranch and save it for Don Ramos. Lucky is supposed to bring the money from Rio Vista as soon as the bank sends it to him. The tax assessor, the man who is the brains behind Sloat, says to Hoppy, What do you want here? The law is looking for you. Hoppy says, Don't mind us. Go right ahead with your auction. The tax assessor Addresses the people assembled. Last picture, second row. Folks, as tax assessor, I'm authorized by law to place this property on sale at public auction. Now, I admit it hasn't much in its favor, but who'd care to open a bidding? One of the ranchers present says first picture, next row. Well, not me. This spread's jinxed. And another hollers. Yeah, you can't raise crops nor cattle on these parts, grazing land this moment, Sloat, last picture of the row, speaks up. Well, just to keep this show interesting, I'll risk a thousand dollars. Well, that's a sporting gentleman. Now do I hear more? Hoppy, first picture, next row, exclaims. Fifteen hundred. At this, one of the crooks whispers to Sloat. Hey, Cassidy could ruin our game. Sloat shouts. I'm bidding two thousand. Hoppy barks back, last picture of the row. Three thousand. California whispers. Hey, nix, 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 Hoppy. We're getting in too deep. Why, what if they call you bluff? First picture, bottom row, Hoppy replies. We got a chance at California. Sloat isn't bidding on worthless land for nothing. And California says, No, oh, what's delaying lucky if we'd only show up with that cash? <laughs> Meanwhile, last picture in the telegraph office in Rio Vista. Lucky is waiting for the bank draft order to come through so he can ride to Hoppy with the money. Time is passing and he's worried. He asks why it hasn't come in. The agent replies, Well, I can't help it if your bank draft order from Buckskin ain't here yet. Relax, son. Those things take time. Well, I should think Lucky would complain because if Hoppy doesn't get that money, maybe that tax man will let that mean Mr. Sloat have the ranch for the money he bid. That's what California's worried about. Oh, my. I hope that order comes through after all the trouble Hoppy's taken to help that nice boy, Philip and his father. Well, we'll find out more about that next week. Now? Oh, is Prince Valiant next, do you think? Well, let's turn over the page and see. All right. Ah, I was right. Here he is on page three again. You remember last week he defeated the barbarians and then uh, started back to the monastery? Yes, let's see if he gets back safely. So here we go with Prince Valiant to the days of King Arthur. Hackett, Brackett, Grey Malkin, and Quince. Music romantic for a fair, fair prince. <laughs> Prince Val, victorious over the barbarians, returns to the monastery with the precious sammy skins he has promised to the monks. Last picture top row, as he greets them, the monks are very grateful to him for having brought warm sammy skins and fresh meat for them. And so, all retire early that night in preparation for their start the next day. Next morning, Val and his companions bid farewell to the monastery and the monks who have been so kind to him. 
At first, their way is easy, for this is the path by which shepherds take their flocks to summer pasture in the high meadows. They pass mountain streams and cross long alpen meadows for his picture bottom road. But ever the white peaks stand stark and threatening against the sky. Then one dawn, Paul, their guide, says, Put aside your cold arms and armor and down warm garments. From now on, your enemy is not human. So they put on the warm cloaks made for them back at the monastery, cloaks of chamois skins and thick wool, and then begin to make their way up, 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 higher through the cold peaks at the top of the mountains. And last picture, no longer is there green grass, but only gray rock and glittering glacier as they toil upward. My, haven't they traveled across some beautiful spots in the mountains? Yes, but I'm afraid now the going won't be so pleasant. You mean because it'll get colder now that they're going up higher? I'm afraid so. And next week we'll see the tops of those mountains. Well, now, which shall I read next? Dagwood. All right, then. Let's go to the first page of the second section of Puck the Comic Weekly. I have the first page of the second section right here. Well, then, very well. Here we go with Dagwood and Blondie. Ramafu, Ramafum, Zim, Zam, Zombie. Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. <laughs> Mr. Dithers has given Dagwood the afternoon off. He arrives home and tells Blondie, Hey, the boss let me off early to help you clean the house for our dinner party tonight. Blondie smiles happily and says, Dagwood, I have an idea. The last picture of the row, she shows the idea to Dagwood, who has his sleeves rolled up and a mop and a pail in his hands. I thought as long as we had to clean the house for our party, we could let Cookie have her little party today, too, this afternoon. So first picture next row, as Dagwood scrubs the floor, Blondie continues. You see, that's killing two birds with one stone. And Dagwood echoes, yeah, two birds. A little later, as Dagwood's cleaning out the bookshelves and shoving around the furniture, Blondie says cheerfully, Oh, the house will look lovely. It's beginning to glisten. And Dagwood, who's beginning to get tired, groans, Oh, my back is glistening. Last picture of the row, the place is finally all cleaned up. It looks as shiny as a needle after a winter and a roll of yarn. And Blondie says, Hooray, we're through. We're ready for two parties. And as Blondie holds poor, tired Dagwood up, he groans, Oh, I'm going up in the attic and sleep on the cot. That's the safest place during a children's party. <laughs> First picture next row. It's time for the party to begin. Cookie comes home with the pals, opens the door, and yells, Mama! My puppy's alive! It's a good thing she said so, because no one would know it. Upstairs in the attic, Dagwood, who has been napping, suddenly exclaims, Oh, great Scott, there must be an earthquake! The whole house is shaking! And then he realizes it's, it's the kids. So he rolls over and tries to go off to sleep again. <laughs> Last picture of the row, the house begins to shake. And Dagwood wakes up again to the terrific racket the children are making. And he yells, It's the A-bomb! It's a cataclysm! And he leaps out of bed, onto the floor. When suddenly, there's a big silence. A horrible silence. A frightening silence. And as Dagwood wonders what's happened, first picture, bottom row... The attic door opens. And Blondie says, Okay, dear. Cookie's party's over. All the children have gone. And Dagwood goes dizzy with relief. A minute later, Blondie and Dagwood are downstairs looking at the living room, which looks like wild horses have kicked it apart. And Blondie says cheerfully, Well, now we have to straighten up the house a little for our party tonight. And Dagwood groans, Oh, it's a shambles. Last picture, Blondie hands Dagwood a bucket of water and a mop again. Grabs the vacuum cleaner out of the closet 
And as they begin their work all over again, she says... That's a good idea, having both parties in one day, isn't it? And Dagwood, so tired, tears trickle down his eyes, slowly groans... Yes, dear. Peachy. <laughs> That was a good idea, having two parties in one day. I just love it when we have two parties in one day. And does your daddy come home for both of them? Oh, no. He always goes out of town on business. Well, he's a smart one. Well, no, I don't know. Uh, Just like you are. Oh, thank you. Oh, now, look. Right underneath Dagwood and Blondie, there's Roy Rogers. And you remember, he's starting a new adventure. So please read that quick. Very well, then. Here we go with Roy Rogers. Yep, I Now here we go with Roy and Trigger. Yep, I Roy has met a friend of his called Doleful Hawkins, who has asked him for help. And as Roy and he ride along today toward a ranch near Rawhide, Doleful says, Yes, sir, Roy. Folks up Rawhide way are bad off. Stock killed by the storm. Range fences down. Roy replies, Well, I'm sure it's not as bad as you make it, doleful Hawkins, but I'll be glad to help on a trail drive. It develops that Doleful wants Roy's help in driving a herd of cattle over a tough mountain trail, and he's told Roy of a valuable steer that can lead the cattle over the dangerous trail. As they dismount at the O'Dowd Ranch, Doleful says... With old Black Jack as lead steer, we might get a herd over the mountains to Rawhide, but... Hey, stop moaning, Dolphal, and show me this lead steer you've been praising. Third picture, first row, Dolphal points out the steer to Roy, and he says, That's Black Jack. My gravy, he's so skinny and puny, he don't look like he can walk to the water trough. Roy replies, Yeah, but he knows every inch of the Rawhide Trail, and that's the important thing. Just then, somebody takes a shot at him. First picture, next row. A pretty girl comes out of the cabin, holding a gun on them. It's Ben O'Dowd's daughter, Wildwood. When she sees it's her friend, Doleful Hawkins, she tells him she thought he was a rustler trying to steal her prized deer. Well, they all go inside the cabin, and Doleful introduces Roy to Wildwood. This is Roy Rogers, Wildwood. We come to hire your blackjack for a trail drive to Rawhide. Wildwood says the blackjack's not for hire unless they take her along. So they sit down to plan the cattle drive over the mountains. <laughs> Meanwhile, at the corral, a stranger has ridden up quietly, gotten off his horse, and is trying to flip a lasso over blackjack's horns. The steer snorts and tries to get away, and the man slams, Quiet, you blasted maverick! I got orders to keep you from leading the trail drive to Rawhide, and I aim to carry him out. <laughs> Last picture, in the cabin, Wildwood, hearing the commotion, goes for her gun, saying she'll ventilate anybody who hurts her blackjack. Doleful exclaims, I knew something like this would happen. And Roy cautions Wildwood, Wait, Wildwood, stay back. Why do you suppose the man is trying to steal that steer? Is it because he's so good at leading the cattle across the mountain? Yes, there's something mysterious about that. Oh, maybe it's wrestlers. Yes, maybe they want to steal Black Jack so he can lead cattle they steal to hiding places in the mountains. Oh, this is a good beginning for the adventure, isn't Mm -hmm. it? Mm-hmm. Now, let's turn over the page and see if Flash Gordon's there. Right over the page we go, and here he is, and I'll read Flash in just a moment. But first, here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. Now, here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly, and on page two of the second section, Flash Gordon. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Rigga, rigga, doon, doon, saskimatash. Let's have music for heroic Flash. (laughs) Professor Bright, a famous scientist, has asked Flash to investigate shooting meteors that have been falling from the moon. Flash thinks someone is trying to destroy Earth and is only too eager to look into the matter. As he, Dale, and Professor Bright are in a plane on an investigation trip, a meteor comes toward them and whizzes by his spaceship and buries itself in the earth with a tremendous blast. The pilot calls out, Professor Bright, I have a message from headquarters. Their radar picked up that meteor's track. It came from the moon. Flash quickly lands on earth.
immediately they set about the task of refitting Flash's spaceship. They load up a stock of atom bomb flying missiles. Professor Bright says grimly, We'll have to destroy the volcano or whatever is shooting out these meteors. Finally, the day comes when the ship is ready for departure. And the giant ship is set up for launching on a mountain top. Last picture top row, Flash, Dale, and Professor Bright approach the ship, ready to take off. First picture bottom row, away they go, speeding toward the moon. Millions watch on TV and hope for success as the rocket starts with a mighty roar. In a few minutes, it reaches top speed of seven miles a second. And soon, the huge rocket is escaping from the Earth's gravity. Last picture, Flash says finally, All right, I'm shutting off the rocket power. Freed from the pull of gravity, Dale suddenly finds herself weightless and floats lightly across the cabin, while Bright stares awestruck at the Earth he has left. Yes, you see, when you get beyond the layer of air around the Earth and away from the pull of gravity, which is a force that pulls you to the Earth, you just float in the air like a bubble because you're lighter than the air. Oh, that must be fun. Yes, but it can be dangerous because you have no control of yourself. Oh, look in the last picture. Is that the Earth they see there? That's the Earth. Oh, next week we'll get to the moon, I think we will. I've always wanted to go to the moon. Well, you'll be here next week and maybe you will. Oh, I'll be here. Now what should we read? Well, um... Uncle Remus. Well, you made up my mind for me in a hurry. So over the page we go, past Buzz Sawyer, turn over the page, go past Barney Google, and we'll skip Donald Duck for now, then turn over that page, and there on page six, under little iodine, is Uncle Remus and his tales of Br'er Rabbit. Say the magic words with me. Hippity hoppity, hoppity, make make it a habit habit to give give us music for old Bull Rabbit. Uncle Remus says, When Br'er Weasel gets to scheming, he can out-scheme all the creatures in the neighborhood. That is, except Br'er Rabbit. Yes, Br'er Weasel is going to pull a trick on everybody in the community. He's up on a ladder in an apple tree, painting the apples gold. That's what I said, gold. And Br'er Weasel says, This is the best scheme I scumped up yet. I paints the apples gold, and then I sells a golden apple tree. (laughs) Br'er Rabbit, who's hiding behind a tree, overhears this, and... Yes, sir, I'll sell this golden apple tree for a zillion dollars, and then I'll go off and I'll settle down in Mississippi. Br'er Rabbit says to himself... So, he's going to fleece the creeters and then slip away, huh? Br'er Rabbit decides to borrow Br'er Weasel's scheme. And he's at his home, third picture of the row, mixing some paint, and he's saying to himself, But when it comes to painting, two brushes is better than one. Last picture, top row, Br'er Weasel is under his tree. And he points to the tree covered with golden apples and says, Look, folks, look, a golden apple tree, the only one in the world. Get rich quick. Now, how much have I bid? Br'er Goose honks, Real golden apples. And Brewer Terrapin asks, Yeah, how much do you want? First picture bottom row, Brewer Weasel says, Well, step up, folks. I is selling cheap. Make me an offer. Just think, golden apples for life. Now, how much am I bid? Forty eleven thousand? Who make it fifty? Little Brewer Sparrow says, Sixty eleven thousand. Seventy eleven thousand. Yeah, eleven eleven thousand. And as everybody pulls for money out of their purses, Br'er Rabbit comes up the road drawing a cart piled high with golden apples. And everybody stares at Br'er Rabbit and they become speechless. And Br'er Rabbit announces, Nice, fresh, solid golden apples. Five cents a dozen. And everybody dashes for Br'er Rabbit. By the time you can say, Give me one, Br'er Rabbit has sold all of his golden apples. And last picture, as the critters run off in 42 different directions, Br'er Rabbit counts his money. Eleven, eleven, zillion and one in five cents. And Br'er Weasel, who hasn't sold a single apple or his tree, holds his head unhappily saying, I, he's been scumped. And Uncle Remus says, Every time you start out to skin somebody, take long some bandages for yourself. (laughs) Br'er Rabbit was a smart 
one. He saw what Bear Weasel was doing, and so he did the same thing himself, only he sold his apples so cheap that everybody bought from him instead of buying from Bear Weasel. <laughs> yes, this is one time when Br'er Rabbit behaved according to the golden rule. Do to others what you would want them to do to you. Yes, he's such a wonderful fellow. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, now let's skip over to the last page. Oh, and I, I know what's there. It's Dick's Adventures. And you are right. And, and this is a wonderful adventure, too, because Dick was on a ship in the early days of America with John Paul Jones. Yes, and they just set fire to a lot of ships in an English port when they saw one of the most famous English ships heading toward them. Oh, I want to see what's going to happen. Maybe there'll be a big sea battle. Well, very well, we'll find out. Here we go with Dick's Adventures. And say the magic words with me. rickety pack a zack a zick Let's have music for Adventurous Dick. From high up in the shrouds, Dick, who is the watchman, yells, Sail ho! British man of war bang down on us! Dick is back in the great days of John Paul Jones, which mathless daring, Jones in one small Yankee frigate is raiding up and down the English coast, defying the whole Royal Navy to find him and stop him. By Jones's ship, the Yankee raider is disguised as a merchant ship. Its guns are covered, but the Royal Man of War is suspicious. John Paul Jones lets us approach within hailing distance, last picture, top row. First picture, next row, the British skipper calls across the water. I say there, what's your name? Where from and where to? And suddenly, John Paul Jones is yelling. Quarters! Dick is running up the Yankee colors. The hidden cannon are rolled into place. The last picture of the row, the English sea captain recognizes John Paul Jones' famous ship and exclaims, The Yankee Raider! First picture out of all. Both ships maneuver for position, crossing and crisscrossing as they let go with broadside. In an hour, the British Drake is a burning wreck. And in this hour, the American Navy is born. After the victory, John Paul Jones slips across the channel into France for repairs. From Ambassador Ben Franklin in Paris, he receives a hero's welcome. And Dick is with him, shaking hands with the famous Ben Franklin, who is then in France. And Dick smiles happily to think that he has been with the hero and has participated in the battle that defeated the British ship. And then, last picture, Dick looks around and suddenly realizes he's been sleeping and has awakened in his own room. And he says, Huh, dreaming again. Yeah, but John Paul Jones fought an even bigger battle. The Bonhomme Richard against the Serapis. Oh, I wonder when that happened. Hmm. Oh, wasn't that an exciting battle? Oh, it certainly was. And so it wasn't it clever of John Paul Jones to pretend to be just an ordinary sailing ship? Yes. And then when the British ship got close to him, he uncovered the cannons and bang, bang, it was gone. Yes, that's what you call smart generalship. Mm -hmm. Now, let's see what's going to happen with Rusty Raleigh. Oh, yes, this is getting mighty exciting because the young man named Smith knows that Rusty has the painting that he's after. And he has to ride with them in the truck so that he could stick close to Rusty and try to get the painting. Mm -hmm. And do you remember last week when they were having dinner in the farmhouse? The man on the radio was announcing that somebody had stolen some important plans from the factory. And all of a sudden, Smitty switched the radio off. And I think that he's the one who stole the plan. Well, let's read and find out. So here we go with Rusty Riley. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and rusty. Smitty has left the farmhouse ahead of Rusty and Tex. Now, after a nice visit with the farmer and his wife, Rusty and Tex are heading back to the truck. Rusty's saying, Hey, that was sure nice of Mr. and Mrs. Jones to invite us to dinner, wasn't it, Tex? Tex replies, Yep. They're sure right fine folks. But I was plumb embarrassed when Smitty jumped up and turned off the news program on the radio. 
Maybe them folks wanted to hear it. Yeah, I noticed that too, Tex. He acted like he didn't want us to hear that news program. He sure acts funny sometimes. Yeah, he sure does, Rusty. That's why I didn't cotton to leaving him alone in the van. He seemed too anxious to get down there ahead of us. Meanwhile, in an office back in New England, some men in the factory are having a very serious meeting. Someone has stolen some plans from the factory where Smitty has been working. Last picture top row, one of the men asks, Uh, when did you first miss them? Another man replies, uh, Yesterday morning. We had occasion to refer to them, and then we discovered that the envelopes contained blank sheets of paper. And he goes on, first picture bottom row. And at the same time... A draftsman who worked on those plans failed to report for work. Another man says, uh, <clears throat> Yes, and I followed that lead, see? His landlady heard him call the airport. I found he bought a seat and a flight to Lexington. But there we lost him. He didn't board that plane. At this very moment, Smitty is in the van, looking through Rusty's and Texas stuff. Smitty says... Well, the fat's in the fire now. That the disappearance of the plans has been discovered. The cops will be looking for me now. I've got to get that horse picture tonight and get out of sight. He picks up Rusty's suitcase and starts to open it. Just then, Rusty's dog, Flip, starts to growl. At this moment, Rusty, who's not very far from the truck, exclaims, Hey, listen, Tex. Flip's excited about something. He sounds angry. Tex replies, Hey, come on, Rusty. I got a hunch that Smith Hombre's up to something. Oh, goody. I'm glad Rusty and Tex came back just in time. Yes. Now if they catch Smitty in the truck with an open suitcase, they'll know he's up to no good. Oh, I just hope he doesn't have a gun in his pocket, because I'm sure Tex doesn't have a gun. Well, that's something you'll have to wait until next week to find out. Oh, now, there's so many things to wait for until next week. I just don't know how I'm going to bear it. Well, we'll find out about those, and you'll have to bear it. Now, that's all the time I have for today. But before I go, here's that nice fellow with some more interesting information. Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I've got to go now. All right. Mr. Connie Weekly Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date, and a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Thank you.